hello my friends hello my life warriors wherever you are in the world i do hope you're having a good day uh yes uh this is the day in day out podcast uh this is episode 30 i had the immense pleasure to speak to jane uh, dohan uh yeah she released a a new book before fearless uh back on the 17th of march i have to say this lady is uh oh, quite an inspiration uh, it was a pleasure to speak to her about uh well her new book and about a number of different subjects uh yeah so i would say please enjoy the podcast yeah uh please have a fantastic day and yeah i'd like to introduce you to jane have a great day be awesome, be excellent, and yeah, be all the positive bees you can be, and enjoy the show. Bye-bye. Peace. One, two, three. Hello, my friends. Hello, my life warriors, wherever you are in the world. This is the Day In, Day Out podcast. This is episode 30. I have Jane Dehan with me uh, today, who is her. Huh, I um, just got to say, I looked at this lady's LinkedIn, education-wise, she is like a behemoth, godlike, to say the least. Uh, somewhat intimidating, but she has a new book out, uh, Be Fearless. Uh, she is from Nigeria, and yes, Jane, please uh, introduce yourself to the lovely people out there. Thank you, Miwa. Don't get intimidated. That's just academic profile. <laughs> look, look, you know, you know what? Like when you go to Warwick for business school, I like, okay, Warwick, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when you when you see Harvard, you're like, I, 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 I I'm not saying like, okay, Harvard, Harvard. Then you go Yale, Yale. So you, you, you know what I mean? Like that is. To just say you want to one or the other, that would be that would be impressive in by itself. Look, my lady, she went to Cambridge for like her MBA, and like I like oh, oh that's very impressive, oh, that's very impressive. Like if she goes to Oxford now, that's where I go. Yeah, I don't want to talk to you because like, all I'll do is that will like, embarrass me. I'll have to go back to school myself. <laughs> I think just sick knowledge. So I, I did, uh, I'm, I'm in the STEM field. So I did study engineering and I studied it in Nigeria. But um, of course, I, I started working in the telecommunication field in Nigeria. And, you know, the job afforded me to like literally travel most of the continents because I had to do it in all kinds of places. Then I moved into management and sales. And that's why I went to do the MBA at Warwick. Right. <laughs> And also uh, leadership courses and all that I did at, at Yale and Harvard. But mm-hmm. the interesting thing, I'm just, you know, the girl next door that uh, just took the lemons she has been given, you know, just made a lemonade, you know. I what? talk about that a lot in my book because I want people to understand that um, in life, the, the situation you serve could be very difficult, but mm. sometimes you can turn that around. You know, you just have to be focused. Uh, you have to show commitment to your goals. And you have to trust in your instincts as well. And mm-hmm. with a lot of hard work and prayer. So one of the reasons I wrote that book was to share that story. Because I know it could sometimes be intimidating. You know, people will come in and I would smile. I'm like, you know what? I, sometimes I look at my 20-year-old self or mm-hmm. myself, my younger self, and I also never thought I could get to this point. So yeah, so that's Jane. I'm married. I've got two kids. My daughter is uh, my daughter is nine, and my son uh-huh. is twelve. So yeah, that's Jane in a quick summary. Now you know what Jane in a quick summary. I I've got to say it doesn't even cover half of the things uh, because like this is the thing. Uh, like I uh, I saw a, a short video of a you uh, on youtube where you like said you would that you came up from a hard neighborhood in like in nigeria lagos is that correct yes 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 so like from there as i touched upon uh you went from there to basically go to like warwick in the uk harvard yale and like you said, mentioned uh you worked for a prominent telecoms company uh, which company was that by any chance? So I worked for Ericsson, a total of about 13 years. So mm-hmm. Ericsson is the telecommunication vendor. 
in between, I worked for Nokia, or well, Nokia Siemens, and the name kind of changed. So I worked for, for, that, for them as well. But you know, like, you're right, I literally came from what we call the slums in Lagos. It was um, one of those places where even getting an education was a luxury. Mm. That's one of the challenges with poverty. You are so limited in terms of your aspiration because of the environment. You, you, know, you even have no ability to dream because it looks hopeless around you. you know? When people around you are just interested in the basics, which is just to eat, just to get yeah. food for the day. You know, every other thing is a luxury and every other aspiration or dream is just an, it's a ridiculous luxury for them. And they don't see it as something that is worth chasing. But I was fortunate, you know, um, while I was younger, I got into one of the government-sponsored boarding schools. So mm -hmm. we call them federal government colleges in Nigeria. So they literally subsidize the very good schools for the middle class. And I, th I think that was the opening for me. And I write that in my book because there I had to meet a lot of people that were from the middle class and all the parts of the country. And that exposed me to all kinds of possibility. You know, you could hear stories about their families and the mm. vacation they went for, or their dad's profession, their mom's profession. And you'd be like, wow, I want to do that. You know, I can do that. You know, I, I want to go on a holiday like them. You know, so those ideas start to creep in. And you start to tell yourself, maybe I can do this. You know, maybe mm. I should do this. You know, I tease and I tell people, you know, even though I studied engineering, yeah a core stem course my first physics assessment or test in what we call you know and in secondary school so that would be like your i think year that would be like year one that's called year six or so mm. or year seven in the uk i literally got a zero like i didn't i couldn't get any question i filled everything the, the physics teacher had to ask me to really think about this whole science thing you know go and think it through but I'm like, no, I want to do it. I'll go back and I'll give it a try. And that's how I've seen life. You know, I've seen life as life will bring the lemons. There will be challenges. There's no success story without the story behind it of how you tried and tried and tried. Mm. But when you keep going at it, and that's how you achieve the goals. But I still ended up doing engineering because I did that, went back again, you know, kept doing, kept going. And then you figure it out. You know, when you're more interested in trying to figure something out, all of a sudden you start to get ideas, you start to be exposed to people that can help you. Because then I start to recognize, oh, I see those girls, they're always making A's in class. Maybe how do they make A's? Maybe I should ask them how they make A's. Mm. Oh, I notice people ask questions in class. I should figure out how do they ask those questions? How come they know these things before the lecturer or before the teacher? You know, and you know, you want to make friends with them, you want to figure out how, you know, how is their routine, mm. you know, how you know, get to do this thing. And you get to learn and learn and learn. And the more you learn, you become more confident. You know, you get the first A and you're like, wow, I can do this. <laughs> Two more A's, three more A's. And before you know it, you're on that track. So, and I think that's how life is with your goals. You know, just think about it. Just basic. You want to keep fit. Yeah. So people associate yourself with, you know, that could be a motivation, you know. You try the first day, the second day, you know, you probably give up. But if the people around you are that motivated and also mm. focused on a goal, you kind of get encouraged to get back on the, you know, bandwagon and keep trying. So, yeah, that's some of the things that, you know, that had helped along the way. Okay. No, that sounds fantastic. Uh, I like the fact that you basically, you looked at yourself, but you looked towards others around you uh, to help improve uh, your, like, well, to help improve your standards, to help in, like, to motivate you to become better and, like, taking those lessons going forward. Uh, uh, when you were in the sort of boarding school, what was one of the main sort of, like, things you took away from there? because I see it as a leaping board for other things for you. It is, I think one of the things I learned was the fact, uh, I think it's what, I, like what I've just said, is the fact that you could actually achieve your dreams. You know, when I went into boarding school, I had no clue what I was doing there. And mm. I'll be frank. Like the first three years, I was clueless. I like just there, you know, like I had low self-esteem. I was coming from a very poor neighborhood and I was meeting all those people from the middle class. You know, I was really intimidated. I just thought I was just happy because 
I was coming from uh, an environment where it was a luxury to get fed once a day. Mm. Then I just get into this new situation where somebody is feeding me three times a day. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. uh-huh. long. So I was just happy to be there. I'm like, mm. I have no goals, no ambition. I was just happy to be in a place where I meet nice people and I get fed three times a day. So from that, you know, it was like, I probably would have no, I had no idea of what could happen next. Mm. But sometimes, I think in the middle of it, I think it was my third year in the boarding school. And it was a serendipitous moment. It wasn't planned. I was bored. And normally when you're bored, you know, you, you, you look for things to keep you busy. So while I was bored, you know, what I was doing while I was bored, what I, what I was doing while I was bored was that I would go in class when we have this prep, you know, prep is when you come yeah. and, you and I would just try, you know, like uh, teach the other students, not because I wanted to teach, because I thought I had to just say something. I was bored. So I was talking to them about what I read and people would ask questions. So I'll go back and read more. And I did, I did it after a while. I found out in class, I could answer questions and I'm like, Ooh, that easy so if you really <laughs> ask the questions you know and you know that's how. so one of the things I, I learned in the summer is that you know sometimes when you get these dreams and all you don't even know how you want to achieve it like I didn't know by the third year when I decided oh I can make A's I, I would like to make A's initially I didn't know how to achieve it but you know mixing up with people asking questions observing orders and things start to come together so you tend to learn that you could dream and the dreams can be achieved. Excellent, excellent. Uh, one of the things uh, over here in the UK they're trying to encourage more uh, is uh, getting uh, young ladies into engineering. Uh, so when you say you're, you did a like engineering STEMs uh, as to a kickoff point, what drew you to it? Because it's not something which is being typically put out there, if you get what I mean. So in hindsight, one of the things I found out was that I'm driven by a challenge. And I didn't know that as a young girl. Yeah. So when I was younger, I had my mom, she was having a chat with one of her good friends and a friend was like, oh, how, you know, like one of her like upper class friends, like, oh, how her kid was in school, studying engineering, it's so difficult. People are dropping out of class. And mm. they're, now they're just few of them. She was just going on and on and I was eavesdropping. And I told myself, yes, I want to do that. That's the tough one. I want to do that. So, you know, in hindsight, I now knew that you know, I was probably driven by the challenge. I was attracted mm. to the fact that it was difficult and people mm. thought it could be done. And I see that in the course of my life that, you know, most of the things that attract me is when you tell me, oh, women don't study engineering. Yeah. Girls study engineering. Then I'm like, yeah, I want to do that. <laughs> Should I do that? You know? So I see that a lot because I know when I, I first told the you know, folks around me that I wanted to study engineering, people were like, oh, now you're a girl. Why do you want to spend all that time in school? I, oh, the boys do that thing. It's a, you have to like, you know, they, they were attributing it to your physical features. You know, you mm. have to have physical strength, you know, this and that. And I'm like, no, no, I think women can do it. I want to do it too. So that's one of the things that drew me there. And kind of when I started studying engineering, I took it upon myself to make sure that other girls and other women knew that it's got nothing to do with your physical strength. Mm. It's actually got to do with your brains, your intellectual ability. So, you know, I became passionate about having more women or girls in STEM. Perfect. So... Uh, you basically, you studied engineering. Was this in uh, the Nigerian University? Oh, University yes, of Nigeria. I studied in Nigeria, University of Nigeria, so I studied, yeah, way home in Nigeria. I see. How, like, um, is, was that a three-year course or a four-year course? No, it was five years. Do this thing for five years, go just do like a four year course and come out of that place. Five years. Oh my oh my god. Um so five years. I was there. Um over here we've got sandwich courses where you yeah. do two years, do a year in industry, and then back into into university. Was it like that for you? You, you do five years. You actually do the, the, you do the sixth year, which is like what we call internship or 
it's, we call it the NYC, where you literally kind of work for the government. You're like, okay. Um, but in my case, I actually did six years because um, it was at the time where, you know, there was a kind of, it was kind of politically unstable. So there was lots of strikes, you know, lecturers and teachers would go on strike and kids would spend more time at home. So I ended up spending six years studying engineering. And of course, I came out and I did the one year internship as well, or the NYC, as we call it. So yeah, I kind of spent a long time there. Oh my God. But it was boring. <laughs> yeah, like, look, put it this way, you are like, you're turning into the very definition of person who's walking the long, the long road, the long, slow road. Rather than look, it was actually longer than that, to be frank. So <laughs> if, if, I, if I, you know, tap into one of my life lessons I learned as a young girl that I really held on there to was the fact that I actually got in to study industrial chemistry. So like I said, I was in this boarding school, you know, three years later, I'm all motivated. I want to mm. do that. I want to do that. Then I come back to the slums and I, you know, tell them the good news. I want to study engineering. <laughs> no, this is like a joke. No, no, don't do that. Don't do that to yourself. Do something easy. Come back. Life is hard enough. You don't mm. have to try it that hard. And, you know, when you have that kind of negativity all around, and I don't think they did it on purpose. They're just people that wanted to be risk averse because they felt life hasn't been fair. We're not having it fair. Don't take too much risk. You know, go, go the non-risky route. Yeah. So just weeks before submitting my application for the university, I changed it. Because everyone around me kept telling me, this is tough. This is difficult. It's for men. You don't waste your time. It will cost us more money. You don't have to spend. You know, there was all this information out there telling me it can't be done. And I changed it. And I didn't even know the cost I changed it to. I just knew that they said, this one is four years. And I flipped the flipped. It's the same cost as I said, okay, I'll do it. And I got into university. I checked my name on the board where you have the results. I was like number one on the list. So I had one of the highest scores. If nice. I had been engineering, I would have been also one of the first 10. And I told myself, so why did I just do this? Mm. You know, why was I so afraid? Why did I listen to all of them? I was restless for the next one year. I fought as hard as I could to change my course from industrial chemistry back to engineering. Mm. So one of the first lessons I learned that my dreams are mine to protect People around me don't necessarily have to buy into that dream. And I have to understand that. But I have to protect my dream and I have to fight for it. Very true, very true. And uh, yeah, touching on a point where you mentioned that, yeah, people are telling you like you should do this, do that. It often comes from a place of good intentions that don't get me wrong, there are some people where they will just be hating uh, on your progress <laughs> but like this is the whole thing when it comes from a place of good intentions and you feel that you might like again sort of drawn into that whole thing of do they have a point yeah maybe they are right maybe they're not and sort of like be having that sort of fortitude to sort of carry on to push forward uh, in what you're doing is a very tough thing to do as well uh, especially and I, when I say this in a field which is not sort of typically seen as something ladies should do. It's like, yeah, by all means, get educated, become a lawyer, get educated, become a doctor, get educated, yeah. become an accountant, anything else, rather than sort of engineering or something which is perceived as getting your hands dirty. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So to push forward with that is very tough indeed. Um, so, with that, uh, after you got your like degree in engineering, six years, <laughs> that's always going to trick me out. <laughs> and, uh, after, like, yeah, oh, but, yeah, still, uh, after you got your degree, uh, what did you do then? Was it a case of you just went out into the world and got a job straight away or was it? Oh, no, 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 I didn't. And I see these things in the book. I didn't. Actually, it was literally a miserable time the first few months because oh, you know, oh. now I have the degree. Yeah, yeah, I had all the plans. I'm going to get a good job. And I was searching for the jobs. Uh, it was, I literally didn't have access, especially in my environment. So, you know, I couldn't just like walk into a company and say, hey, this is Jane. I need a job. Mm. There were no structures in place. You know, you couldn't do that. So 
most times you just cold calling and you know how it is people you know you're at the gate and like excuse me who are you here to see yeah and you actually don't know anyone so i'd be like um the hr manager we don't have a hr manager oh, uh, manager or oh, we don't have a you know i'm like flipping all the names hoping mm-hmm. that one of them will stick so that was a, and it was just about a three-month period if i think back but it felt like forever mm-hmm. for someone that was in a situation that i really wanted to get out for you know i was literally leaving the place you know like getting a, a meal was a big of a struggle so i really wanted to get a job i wanted to change things but I was fortunate that I got a break. And I got a break from someone I didn't even know. First of all, a shout out to all the people that do all the work that sometimes we ignore. So first of all, you know, it was a security guard. He was nice because a friend had told me, oh, that company over there is an engineering company. And I hear they pay well. They're looking mm. for insurance. And I'm like, oh, I'll go try. You know, I go the first day, second day, third day, kept going. After a while, the, the security guard is like, you know what? Okay, you can go to the reception. And, you know, you keep trying the reception and she's like, no, I don't know this guy, yeah. I don't know this guy, I don't know, there's no HR, there's no. Then one day she told me, you know what, keep coming here. This is what I'm going to tell you. You go home today. When you come back on Monday, just walk straight to me. Tell me, I have an appointment to see this person, Mr. Larry, so, so, and so. I will call Mr. Larry. If he comes, please don't mention my name. I never referenced him, you know. You can try and talk him and see if he can, you know, help you out. And that's what I did. I showed up after the weekend on a Monday, walked straight to her. She kept to her word. I said, I'm here to see Mr. Larry Susan. And so I have an appointment. She called him. Mr. Larry spent an hour with me trying to understand how I got his name. You know, who referenced me, you know. And I spent that hour trying to convince him why he should recruit me. So you can imagine. <laughs> <This was laughs> probably 26 or 25 year old self. But the good thing is that he did recruit me. He, he gave me a chance. He said, oh, come see the HR. Let me see your CV. Mm-hmm. And he gave me my first big break. I didn't know him from Adam. I didn't know him anywhere. And I actually did something wrong, like, you know, just cold calling and, you know, surprising him in that manner. Mm-hmm. But he was so helpful. And that's how I got my first job. I worked as what we call an ed station engineer. So you see those big masks and dishes you have. So yeah. we mind them or we take care of them. So it's like, a, it's, a, it's one of those jobs you have to walk on a rooster 24 hours, you know. So somebody's on the morning shift or afternoon shift or evening mm. shift. So that was my first job. And I was so happy and proud to do that. <laughs> ah, loving it, loving it. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this is the thing. One of the things I would say people, and um, I think it's going to be very much called for when we come out on the other side of lockdown. I don't know what it's like in Nigeria right now. Uh, but down here, it is lockdown. <laughs> yeah. But like the whole thing is, I think after the lockdown, when every when the world tries to start up again with regards to all the different economies and stuff like this, uh, I think there's going to be a period of time where it's going to be hard for people to sort of get themselves going, to get themselves into the rhythm of things, and like showing, like talking about how your persistence uh, after you came out three months without knowing you were going to get a job it might like it never seems uh when you look back upon reflection you go oh it's only three months but uh, when you're in when you're in the thick of it it was this felt like forever yeah and when you're in that sort of forever moment it just being able to like stay motivated it's being able to keep pushing yourself forward uh taking that next step seeing that that next person going to that next company it is vitally important and i think uh, with regards to what's going to happen, at, I don't know what's going to happen in the next three months, nor do you, but in, over the, when, when we do get back into it, just being able to be persistent, just being able to stay focused, being motivated, it's going to be more important than ever just to help Very people things out. Very true. And also, maybe if I add to one thing, just to also know that sometimes mm. people come from the unlikely places. Mm. Just, you know, be open that help might come from unlikely places. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have thought that that receptionist would have pointed me in the right direction. You know, I probably was there looking for, if I get to be introduced to someone that works in some big office, but the person that would actually point you in the right direction might be someone you take for granted. So just yeah. be open to the fact that help might come from unlikely places. 
respectful, be respectful, be respectful. Um, uh, yeah, like, so you started working, like, it was a case of, like, uh, how did that go from there? Did you spend a couple of years there or a year there before you sort of, like, got onto, like, Ericsson type situation? Frankly speaking, I didn't spend up to, I spent, uh, like, 18 months. It wasn't up to two years. It wasn't a long job for me. Mm. Then I got into Ericsson. And, you know, it was even a tough decision making that, um, making that decision. Mm. It was a tough one because I had to, um, I had to, um, you know, when I, when I initially got that Ericsson offer, I couldn't see the value, you know, because it was, I was going to end the same. I thought, you know, why would I move to Ericsson? Mm. It occurred to me that, you know, maybe for the career growth, you know, Ericsson was a bigger company, had more structure, it had more opportunities for career growth. So I decided to go with working for Ericsson. So I started my journey in Ericsson and it was interesting too. Like I said, things will happen. You get all these things happen. And one of the big things I learned is that sometimes you have it all planned out, but be open and flexible that you might have to change your pathway. You know, ultimately you're trying to achieve the same big vision. So when I got into Ericsson, I was a very technical person. So I did technical jobs. I fell into sales. I keep saying it. It wasn't deliberate. It wasn't planned. It was just one of those moments again, you know, we talk yep. about those moments. Like I was kind of bored as well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have much on my plate. And uh, someone from another department had um, 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 come over to offer me, like they had a project and they didn't know who could run it. And mm. they were all easy. And he did tell me like a disclaimer, there is no increase in any salary, nobody getting any extra promotion if you do take on the project they just wanted someone to run that project and he thought that you know I, I was energetic and i could do it and even my colleagues were like why would he take it you know like there's nothing to be you know you're gaining nothing mm. from it. i wouldn't take it but i thought you know i'm bored you know like i'll take it you know just yeah. keep it easy but they told me from day one that that project was very unsuccessful every way they ran it they ran it in Europe and South Africa, other mm. places it was very unsuccessful. And they were not, they did not have any ambition that it was going to be successful. They just wanted me to run it. Okay. But course, you know, like your normal self being the Jane, I thought huh. I could do this and do it really well. So I went in all in and I ran that project for nine months and it did become successful. So the client uh, we ran the project for wanted to take it further and they wanted to you know, blow it out and make it bigger. So mm. as you we would have a party when we when we the project is successful with the club <laughs> celebrate so we had this cocktail thing going on and everybody was there we're drinking being fun and all that and i didn't know someone was observing me in the party so the head of the department i ran the project for he came over to me and said jane i would love you to come work for me as a salesperson mm -hmm. and i'm like ah you're drinking we're all drinking <laughs> <laughs> I get it. The project was successful. You know, ask me again on Monday. I'll take you yeah. serious. And he's like, no, no, no. It's not a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, why? He's like, you know my clients more than me. And I'm like, hmm? He's like, you know everyone in this room. I mm. said, yeah, I ran the project. And I had to go chasing all of them for one thing or the other. He's like, no, no, no. You don't get it. You literally know everyone in this room. And that for me is important. I thought it was a joke. He showed up on Monday morning in my office and like, take a laptop and come in with me. I told you, your new job is awaiting. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes life, life would, uh, I say be flexible because I struggled with that for a while. I'm like, mm. but I'm a technical person and I want to do technical stuff. But I was fortunate. I did have like an informal mentor. So he was like, you know what? If you really want to get into management, this is a good route to go to management mm. to expose you to new skills. So think about it. And you know, after we had that chat, so sometimes you never tell. You got to be open to new things, you know. And especially mm. with what is happening right now, I think there will be lots of changes after the whole COVID crisis. Yeah, likely the the future of work will change. The way we work will change. New organizations will crop up. Some of them, old ones, probably shut down, but be open to know that with new skills or with some, you know, inherent skills you have, you could probably forge a new career for yourself. 
No, indeed, indeed. No, like this is the thing uh, with with that. When you say new, like the working environments changed. Um, I think uh, with regards to people working from home and remotely, I think this has basically hyper accelerated everything forward for maybe by uh, 10 years or so, because it was slowly going that way. But this now is just like anyone who had sort of uh, have misconceptions or basically weren't 100% sure. Uh, I think that for many organizations which could do it and, and now are doing it, it's gone. And I think the whole realm of work uh, on that side of things, I can see when office leases uh, come to an end in like over here, that like companies will get smaller spaces yeah. and have more people working uh, remotely. I think the thing which is going to be the next thing is there's going to be an uptake uh, in very super fast broadband. I, I can see that happening. Definitely. It's already happening. Even here, we saw that with the start of the whole lockdown, uh, data consumption just spiked. Mm. Spiked. You see, we're using tools like Zoom. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. yeah like thing Before the crisis now, even my kids are schooling using Zoom. Yeah, but this is the thing I used to use for my remote podcast, Skype. And like about two weeks before I, like the lockdown happened, I went, oh, try Zoom. Because the whole thing with Skype, it's a little bit, how can I put it? It's a little bit too much friction because you've got to have Skype. And yeah. if you don't have Skype, then it's a case of getting those people to get Skype, downloading and then doing I this. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just like so much friction rather than Zoom. You just simply have Zoom, send them the link, it downloads, and once it's there, you're good to go. Yeah. yeah. So there'll be new things. Well, I think we should all be open to the fact that there will be new things and we should be open to take the change and adapt. Mm. To survive, you would have to adapt. Yeah, you know, I agree. Um, I think that's one of the things uh, and everyone's going to have to do. Uh, over the next, uh, over the second half of this year and like 2021, uh, for sure, uh, adapt, change, and see where it takes us, hopefully, uh, to better places, uh, much stronger hopefully places. Hopefully to a better place. That's oh, the, yeah. That's the hope. Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, tell me this. When you, when you were studying your MBA, um, was that over in America or the UK? Sorry, I don't know. I studied my MBA in the UK, actually. Okay. In the University of Warwick. So there was the Warwick Business School. And I did it as a modular student. So I used to fly into the UK every eight weeks. Yeah. And the weekends. So I was flying on a Friday, uh, Friday night. Yeah, I used to fly on Friday night. Friday night. Yeah, Friday night. And I'll leave the UK, the last flight on Sunday. Right. Uh, yeah, because... Um, my well, Sorry, I used to run it for a week. So it was a week's program. Okay. So I'll fly in on a Sunday, then run the classes Monday to Friday. Then I take the last flight out Friday night. That's what I did. Yeah, that was must be very intense uh, because uh, my lady, she did a year in Cambridge at Judd. Oh, uh, so she was looking at a London Business School, uh, which uh, she looked at the executive program, which you did. Uh, to like study and work at the same time but like she looked and she basically said no no I'll do one or the other but doing both at the same time it's 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 not easy let's just say it's not it's easy a lot of time because I was doing that and I was working and you know that's the thing with life you know in hindsight I look back and I say it make it look easy it was mm. a very tough period because I didn't have study leave. So I used up my leave days going to school. Whoa. So it was a tough, tough time. And even I remember then I was dated. So my husband, uh, now my husband, he'd be like, how do you make these crazy decisions? Like your school fees is equivalent to your entire paycheck. And you're like, how are you going to survive? I'm like, I'll survive. <laughs> you know, I was, I, was, I was making, because, you know, when you're driven by a goal, sometimes yeah to make those sacrifices and they don't look very very attractive at the time you make it they're really tough like you're talking about your lady mm. having to make those kind of choices and at that time maybe you just want to party with your friends and enjoy but now you have to study you're like you literally don't have any spare time because yeah. you're being 
studying after work. So, but those things will bring you rewards. Those things will bring you rewards, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, with the executive in Warwick, uh, is that a is that an eighteen month program or is that a year program? No, it was more than a year. So, the the one year is where you do like your main courses. Then I had to do mm -hmm. another eighteen months yeah. where you do the optional courses, and those optional courses. Uh, are the ones you can then decide. Some of them you can do remotely, others you can travel. So it was about, uh, I did it for about uh, three years at the end of it, because I had to even defer it for a while because I was pregnant. Ah, ah, yes. uh, with your son. And then I got married, then I got pregnant. <laughs> well, but yeah, you know what? I don't think, uh, just judging by your character and like what you've said before, I don't think doing it the easier, ah, yeah, just, I showed up, I went to school, and then yeah, while working, and then do it. This I done, yeah. No, like I would went, I would be like saying that like really, he, he just yeah did it. Uh, that sounds like he did it really easy. It was like yeah, I got married, had a baby. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it wasn't that easy. You make it sound easy, but it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, no, uh, it's okay. So yeah, every time you're stepping up to the challenge. Uh, what may I ask? What has given you such a drive behind uh, what you're doing because like yeah look don't get me wrong like got being going to the boarding school uh which you know i mean helped you like with one stage then going to like university for six years like you know hey that is no easy task then going to warwick and like look we haven't even touched on harvard or yale uh, mm -hmm. yet but what is the driving force for you to do all of this? Where, like, let's just say, it, just doing half of that is like, you know what I mean? A fantastic life in accomplishment. I think initially, if, if, I, if I reflect on it, I was more driven by survival. I mm. wanted to get out of poverty, you know, coming from very humble beginnings. I just mm. wanted to get to a point where I could at least take care of myself or those around me. So that was the drive. On the line, I was driven by a challenge because I was always looking for the ones they say you shouldn't do or you, should, you can't do or it's difficult to do. That was always a motivating factor. But I know these days I'm more driven by my need to want to share what I've achieved to create an impact. You know, my passion to want to tell other women, you can do it. Look, I did it, you know to tell all the young girls, like, you, you can go for it. No one is stopping you. Don't let anyone stop you. So that has been a driver of late. And you could, it, it's really been a driver for my book, for my nonprofit, even for the work I do. Because I remember having a conversation with someone and she was talking about my job. I'm like, you know what? Ah, you know, um, you know, are you enjoying your job? You know, it's, it's, it looks like it could be very tough because I tend to travel a lot and you know, mm. manage a lot of things. And I told her, but I'm still fulfilled. It's very, you know, it's really hard work, but I'm fulfilled because I think it's more than a job for me. Because I take those roles that there've been very few women or probably no, like for example, my role in my office, I'm the only lady and then you're the boss, you know. But I do that because I feel it's more than just a job. It's me probably telling some other woman aspiring to be like me, a younger version of myself, my daughter, my younger self, that did you see her? You can do that and you can do much more than that. Mm. That becomes a driver to do it, to say that you need to keep these doors open so younger girls can go through this door. So it's not just about you being there and be happy that you're there. You do it so that younger girls can aspire to do this and better than this. No, I, I see that. I see that. Um, I see that within you and like this is the thing uh, is this the like is this some of the things what encouraged you to like uh, go with, along and start doing talks at? like i see you've done a TED talk. yeah 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 that's what that's what that's what that's really the motivator behind it because you know sometimes you tell yourself i don't have time i'm too busy mm. you know, like I, sometimes you are really too busy to to do that but i i thought you know like what would that what would be the best gift i would give myself and I started doing, reflecting on that really like four years ago, because I was doing that initially after school, then I stopped because I, I had a very close friend. We did that together. 
And once I lost her, I, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't get myself to do it. I just felt, I don't want to get involved in any of such things. I just want to live my life and like hide under the table, do my thing and disappear. Mm. You know, you go through that phase and I was grieving. I found out I was grieving. But about four years ago, I told myself, this is my purpose. This is what I love to do. I want to give back. And that has been the motivator. And I create time for it. Literally, when people, people are shocked that I respond to their messages, you know, like when they send all those social media messages, they're like, can I have five minutes? Can you do this? And you mm. respond. People are like, she responded. You know, like, they're literally shocked. But I do because I, I became aware that that's what I want to do. That is what I'm driven by currently. And I want to do that so I would create time for it. So sometimes, of course, it's not easy. Like I remember, you know, telling, I think I posted it on social media. Like I had gone to Ghana over the weekend for mm. uh, one of those career talks with a university, it's a university of minds and technology in Ghana. And the only 10% women in that school. And that's one of the reasons I, why I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go. 10% women, we go, go talk to those women. But I came back late. I was stuck in the airport. It was like almost midnight. And, you know, my kids are calling. My husband is calling. I'm like, oh, I'm trying to get a taxi. Mm. I'm tired. But I was fulfilled. I was happy because of what I had just done. Mm. To see the smiles on those girls, to see the fact that they were happy that I came and I could share that story and I could encourage them and I could give them access to say, you know, call me. You know, I will create some kind of mentoring platform. And I'll connect you to mentors that would help you. That made me happy. That made me happy. So yeah, that's one of the big drivers. And that's why I wanted to launch the book the way I did. So initially, the plan to launch the book was I was going to go to 20 universities in Nigeria. Okay. And I had to, you know, talk about the book and talk about, you know, do career talks around the book. Because I felt like I really wanted them to read the book. I thought, you know, the best mm. thing I could do from this book is to see that I could impact the younger ones with the book. So I was all pumped up, ready to go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then I found the way. <laughs> Came in with a name called COVID. <laughs> like, yes. So it's like, mm, damn you. <laughs> but like this, like this is the thing. Uh, with like with all you've come like done and come through, like you now, uh, with regards to the book, um, is it a case of it's just been released on Amazon, or is it a case of it come like, or is it being released everywhere? So yeah, so the first launch was on Amazon because we wanted to make the e-copies first available. Mm -hmm. So the second launch, which was meant to have been on April sixth, was put to put it in bookstores. Okay. But we had to put a hold on that because you know the whole lockdown, um, we couldn't get the cargo shipments uh, on track because most of the countries were also freezing cargo movement for things like that. But we do have the book on Amazon. We have it in most of the online stores in Nigeria. So they have like Okada, mm. Lito, Bambi Books. Those are online stores like, um, like Amazon. So we, we have them available there. And we are trying to also get more online stores in other countries in Africa. But hopefully when the lockdown is lifted up, we would have them physically in bookstores. Mm -hmm. And with regards to uh, Be Fearless, what are some of the things it's uh, covering? So the Be Fearless, a lot of things about personal development, you know, mm. it's a lot of things about mentoring and coaching for young people that are taking on a career. Lots of insights into personal leadership when you're going on that journey, because you need to be able to, I believe in leadership inside out. You have to mm. lead yourself out then you can lead others. So those kind of concepts, we will talk about them. But there's a lot of it on the line factors. There's a lot of it that is inspirational and motivational. I didn't even see the book that way, but that's a lot of feedback I get from people that read it. They're inspired by the stories of, you know, just picking yourself up yeah. on the ground and going after something against all odds and achieving it. And I find it so relatable, you know, something we can relate to during this whole crisis is the fact that lots of us are feeling a bit anxious you know how would it be the economic downturn would it come back you know mm. we lose jobs and there's all mental anxiety and emotional anxiety when would this be over people are dying and all that so that kind of stress could probably make a situation look hopeless you just feel you don't even have to dream you don't need to plan 
Mm. But one of the things I learned from my past, you know, is the fact that if you keep going at it, you know, it's like against all odds. If we keep going at it, you know, we help each other, support each other with whatever tools we can now. You know, like what we're doing is online. We can all get through this, get through this together. And when we do get through it together, the sky is the limit. God knows what the new phase of the world will be. Maybe the new planet Earth will be driven in the right direction this time around. Mm. Yes, we can hope. We can hope and we can pray uh, with regards to that. And you know what I mean? Um, I would say um, if we uh, start approaching it with some degree of positivity or, or some degree of unity, uh, by all means, I think we will be uh, hidden in a better direction. Um, hopefully a less selfish direction and yeah see what happens uh from there uh yeah uh with regards to the book is it just like you said digital um it's going to be paperback are you going to do an audio version or have you done an audio version of the book okay it's first time i'm announcing it yes we have an audio version in the works it's going to be out later in the year you know? oh, okay yeah, yeah, yeah. But we do have a, the paperback version, hardcover, and the ebook or the Kindle version are all available uh, via Amazon. But the mm. version is in the works. So that's, that's the next phase of the fearless. Okay, great, great, outstanding. Uh, so let, let me say this if there, was a, if there was something you could do, like, in the next say six months what would that be to help say improve things uh in either your job sector or like with the community in general a lot of things i know that i do have a passion for younger people mm. and um one of the things i wanted to do as a person is um, use my story my life uh, to really motivate the younger ones, especially those that don't have access or don't have support. And I haven't come from the slums myself. I wanted to use that experience. And that's what I see I can do in the next six months. Mm. In the sector, really, what I really want to do, and I, I see myself doing the next six months, is really supporting more women to remain in the sector we see a lot of women come into the sector, but then they leave. Uh, mm. They leave for various reasons. They find it sometimes difficult to adapt as they climb up. Mm. That's one of the reasons I have stayed back because I felt we need women at the table. If you want those changes, you should be there to represent and talk about the changes you want. If you're not there to represent, nobody knows about the changes you're asking yeah. for. You know, it's often easier to change it from the inside rather than the outside. Uh, yeah. be part of the solution rather than like shouting at the and problem outside, yeah so and i really want to do that i see myself doing that in the next six months really being at those places where we can talk about change and how we can improve it and that's one of the good things i feel came out from the lockdown you know sometimes you have to see the silver lining especially here down here in africa people have been really averse to working from home mm. or working remotely and that's one of the tool sets I felt could really help women, especially women during, you know, during the career journey. When they start to have kids and get married, sometimes they struggle to really combine these things. And I thought one of the tools that could have been helpful is, you know, if they could work some, from home some days, you know, especially for roles that you don't necessarily have to be physically present, mm. work from home either some days or a couple of hours in a week. It could really help when you don't have any daycare facility or you don't have any support or you have to be physically there as a parent. Maybe you have to take the child to the hospital or to the clinic. So that's one of the good things is that I see organizations being a bit more relaxed and accepting of the new way of work mm. and accepting that, yes, you could actually have, um, you could actually work from home and it would be acceptable. So that's uh, one of the good things I would say. That has come up from this whole lockdown. Mm. Oh, question How good is the high speed internet in Nigeria at the moment? The reason why I ask this is because in the UK, if you're in a major city, it's like you can get fantastic speeds. And looking at some news reports, there has been people which have just been like, What are you using? You've seen that you see what their news and you're like, going, Ugh. And if you're in the countryside, they're like, they're 
we've started a scheme a few years ago where like there are some like that towns or villages in the countryside which have nothing or it's super super fast what so what's it like in nigeria right now is it is the standard really good we've got 4g <laughs> you've got 3g <laughs> That's not the issue. We do have the technology, but I think one of our biggest challenges is that we don't have coverage everywhere. Mm. So we don't have <clears throat> continuous coverage. So we do have that disparity, the whole digital divide. In the cities, we would have access. Mm. Outside the cities or outside those uh, main urban areas, we lack access. But that's where most of the population is. Yeah. We still have a challenge trying to provide broadband to the majority of the of the of the population so that's where we are lacking and i think that's where a lot of focus should be and that's one of the good outcomes of also what is happening because we have also discovered uh, we can live like that so i'll give you an example so of course in the cities where i am i have broadband fiber so i have, I have access to broadband and very high speed broadband sometimes mm. even better than what i would get in other countries like when i go to europe but people in the rural or semi-rural areas don't have that kind of access. And now with the whole lockdown, we would really have loved schools to be online. Yeah. Because we don't know how long we have to stay at home. But what we have discovered is only people in the cities that can have access. Kids or schools in the remote or semi-urban areas, they don't have access. Mm. So they're literally going to be at home doing nothing having no way to access them and no way to support them during that period. And even for the governments to even access the population in those areas, because now we want people to isolate, we don't want people moving around, but then how do you as a government, you know, pass on that information, yeah. access them, if you don't want to use the traditional media. So that's one of the good things we have discovered that we need to step up. We need to ensure that we have broadband access most of the uh, most of the parts of the country mm, yeah like i think with regards to I, I made mention to it earlier i can like i know one of the priorities for my household is it's going to be a case of when we change our contract we're going to have a much like we're going to get much more faster internet connection oh, it's yeah yeah no it's just a case of you like uh, between me doing this and like uh, my lady working, like doing her work stuff, like stuff. It you all of a sudden there'll be times where if she's pulling a lot of data or if I'm like take up a lot of bandwidth, it slows right down. And look, I'm I'm saying that sitting in uh, London, travel city of the UK, and like okay, I would say we've got her okay. Like we've got a fast internet connection. You can run your Netflix and everything like that with it, but still need more especially with everyone else pulling uh, from that same pool so it's like yeah uh, you kind of see the limitations uh, globally uh, the only reason why i make mention of like nigeria is just because uh, i used to work many moons ago in sort of uh, maritime communications oh so, that's good yeah so i know about that like, some of the initiatives which have been brought in with telecoms and stuff like yeah. this so when people like think some of some African countries, they think ah, it's not going to be that good, which I know it's not true. It's just, I don't know what the sort of range of the coverage is. It's just like here in the UK. Well, it is, is very good in the cities. Like I'm in the city, like, mm. literally when you talk about, I have, uh, the other day I was checking to see oh, how many connected devices I have. So many things that have access to the internet. And I have over 20 of it. <laughs> you don't even know how far you've gone until you really reflect. Uh, we have the PS4s and we have yeah. four star TVs and you know, I want to stream a different Netflix movie. My son is on his yeah. own, my daughter, my husband. And you know, we're really high consumers of data. You know, like we <laughs> are watching videos. My son is playing his PS4. My daughter is, you know, you know streaming something or even mm. just um, doing online school. They are always using, you know, video to do their online school so they'll be online doing this since i've been working online having meetings on zoom my husband will be doing the same mm. so we have all these connected devices your smart wristwatches you have your amazon uh, your uh, uh what do we call it the 
Uh, wait, uh, Alexa? Alexa, you know, those are things that consume data. You have all those things on at the same time. So we, you, you're definitely using data. But I know that the challenge will be, we would like to have that when I go to the rural areas, when I go to my village, I would also be yeah. able to, I want to be able to also stream Netflix there. <laughs> yeah, that's what we are asking for, that people in the remote areas will also have access to digital tools mm -hmm. and to help them in terms of economically, in the work they do, give them access to ways they can even sell their products. So that will be the next phase we, we would really have to focus on. Mm. And yeah, and seeing as Nigeria, when it comes to like technology, is like oh, wow, it it's one of the powerhouses of Africa with regards to moving that next stage forward, and um, putting that vital infrastructure in at across the whole of the country. So yeah, uh, someone in a rural part of like Nigeria will be able to take a full advantage of that uh, can only help improve people's lives uh, that much better. Yeah, it, it will. It will. It will be a good way to do that. And not like we haven't come far. You know, this is a country we literally have about 90 million subscribers. One of the biggest network here, MTN, has about 60 million subscribers. You know, you're talking about big countries in Asia to get to those numbers. You know, like mm. countries like Ghana. How many people are in Ghana? Maybe like 25, 30 million. Yeah. So there are large networks in themselves, but the reality is that is, you know, in relation to what we have as a country, we have about 180 million people. So we still have a long way to go. We yeah. only have coverage in about 60%. I think we have about 60% of the population connected. So we still have to figure out how to give access to the 40%. And talking about, you know, talking from my knowledge of the sector, I know it is not as easy because for the carriers or the operators like the AT&Ts yeah. and all that, they would want to see a business case to go to the rural area. You know, you want mm. to be sure I can make money. And sometimes you don't make money the traditional way when you go to these areas because they wouldn't consume data like the city. Mm. So they have to be incentivized to go to the rural areas and give coverage. It has to be more than making money. There has to be a reason to go there. Ah. And I think that's why we, we need to put a lot of focus or the, the government needs to put a lot of focus because we have to find a way to incentivize the private sector to provide access for those in the rural areas. No, no, very true. Uh, do you, like, is there, a, what would you think would be one of the ways they might look to in, like, incentivize themselves to get into those areas? I think one of the ways they could do, uh, we will be talking about this partnership, because uh, the biggest challenge is your cost driver is the infrastructure. You know, putting those radio base stations mm. and towers in, it is quite expensive. And if you put it in a place where you don't get a lot of calls, so what we call your app is low. So the average revenue you get from a subscriber is lower yeah. than this city. Then you, you don't, you're not incentivized. But if it's a partnership with the government, so the government incentivizes you by either giving you a tax break or reduces the duties on the equipment you put there or mm. takes away the cost of the permits. And I did that in Ghana while, while I was there. If there's that joint partnership, it reduces the cost. Mm. So the barrier to entry goes down a bit and the private sector goes there. Another way we could also look at it is also the value. You know, Even though we say these people are in the rural areas, there's a lot if you can adapt products for them because you can't take the same products you have pitched in the urban areas their needs are slightly different so things like e-health you know in, in the urban areas it's easy you know you can just drive to the hospital mm. in the rural areas you probably have to do a two-hour drive that's after walking for two hours then you take a a, a, a bus or a, a taxi for another two hours to yeah <laughs> so if you had Things like e-health, you know, you have community centers where people can go and remotely they would be able to access experts in the cities, you know, mm. expert, uh, consultant doctors in the cities. And it could be a service they could subscribe to. So it can be, it can be packaged in a way they can consume it. So you, you can tell them is, you know, like 500 pounds to, to access a cardiologist. If you tell them if you subscribe for five pounds a month on this e-health uh, platform, we can ensure that it becomes like an insurance that if you're ever sick and you need to see an expert, we will connect you with one remotely. So those are kind of things you could do. You could do things like, you know, the payment 
which is one of the ones they figured out, which is quite common here. Yeah. Supporting e-payments or mobile money because, of course, you, you don't really have banking in the rural areas because the brick and mortar banks don't really like to build. You know, you can build a bank yeah. community with only 40 or 20 or 100 people living in it. But if we do have mobile money, so the people in the rural areas have a way to transact and do financial transactions, that would definitely help. And it won't be for free. They pay a little bit of transaction fee, but then they know that they can transfer money or receive mm. money, pay people or transact. There are numerous ways we can support their sector, like the agricultural sector, which is a big thing in the rural areas. So there's e-agriculture. How can we help farmers sell their products, produce? Maybe create an e-commerce platform, give them access to the platform. They meet other traders. They can trade, they can sell. They can know what cocoa is trading for the day, what cassava is trading for the day. So they know, do we want to sell? Do we want to sell? Have access to weather information. There's so much you can help them with. And they can pay a bit of a subscription fee. So the model will change. You know, like in the oven, in the oven or in the cities, people can easily pay for large chunk service but in the in the rural areas you need to slightly change the way you you you, you charge them you have to charge them the way that is easier for them to consume it and pay for it so there, there are all kinds of things you know the, 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 i think that is an untapped market mm. we call it the bottom of the pyramid that is a really untapped market and when you do it right you tend to see the value yeah like this is a thing with like the with just those two models you mentioned, like, yeah, I can see like great opportunities with that. I have with on the side of health, especially what's been going on lately. Uh, I think that's going to be, well, uh, think, like, fingers crossed, we don't go through anything like this anytime soon again. But I think that sort of being able to access uh, doctors and like basically specialists will be highly beneficial. Um, I know with Ericsson, it's more the sort of tower side rather than sort of hard cable uh, mm -hmm. in. Uh, so yeah, that will be highly beneficial. I know in India, uh, they do a lot of sort of like payment processing and payments uh, via their mobile phone. So like, yeah, it's not like something which is a completely out there concept, if you get what I mean. It's it's been it's been done. It's it's been done in other places. It just needs to like be implemented. Um, it's just because I think one of the big challenges we have in Africa, we don't have data. We have a huge informal economy, so access to data sometimes it doesn't even exist. Mm. So, and you know how it is with structured businesses. You want data. You want to see what the data tells you. And yeah. when you don't have data to work with, it's so difficult to forecast or just even you know, decide you know, how the business case or your business case will look like. So I know businesses struggle with that. And I remember the project I ran, we, we struggled because just even understand what is the population density. Then we mm. decide, should we go or shouldn't we go? There was no data. There was no good data to, to really... Uh, you know, get a good idea of what the population density is. But so some of the companies just take that risk and try it. And we we sometimes are pleasantly surprised when we mm. do. Like in the case of Ghana, we were, we, we, we put on those sites. We had, we couldn't get a good idea of the population density. So we couldn't tell how many people are there, how many of them are educated, how many of them are illiterate, how many of them have access to phones or smartphones. It was mm. so difficult to get that data. So we just went there blind, but we were shocked. The sites themselves were congested. There you go. Now, I, I imagine it's a bit like the chicken egg sort of thing, the way you're talking, because, I, okay, as soon as you put a tower in, you yeah. know how much, how many people are logging into that tower, how many pings are going off. But before you can do that, you need to have some type of like real sort of justification to put yeah. that tower yeah. in. So like, um, and but like the whole thing, I can, uh, if I know there's a tower being put in and like that'll be my sort of main communication, and uh, maybe it's just the way I'm thinking coming from like being brought up and raised in the UK, but I can remember a time before cell, like, like cell phones and towers and everything like this, uh, which I would say anyone who's in their early or mid twenties uh, have no idea about. <laughs> you you lived without mobile phones 
what type of world was it? <laughs> it's like, I think that's how my kids feel now. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah. that's ICK. Um, so, yeah, yeah, there's like, a, mm, you know what? I had to go to a place called a video store, get a videotape, put that in, and yeah, it's like, no, it's totally alien. But I would say if the towers went in, I the demand will appear uh, uh, from nowhere. Uh, well, not from nowhere. I reckon the demand is there. It's just a case of just giving people access to it. it people and access, and what we also find out that you actually create the market as well. There's a segment of it that comes on because you came. Mm. You, know, you change people's habits. Just the fact that people now have coverage. Uh, maybe if they're older people, their their kids or their children in the cities realize, oh, I can now call my grandpa, so mm. I should get a phone. You know, I should get him some airtime. So you kind of change the habits, and then they start to call their grandparents more often because they found out now that there's a good coverage where gra the grandparents live. So you can actually then create activity just by being present. People now know that oh, we can transact using the phone. Mm. You know, I need to to figure out how much the price of cocoa is. I don't need to walk all the way 10 miles. I could just call and ask my, my fellow farmer how much was the price today. You know, so you kind of create a market. Yep. There is a bleeping noise going off. I don't know. I don't know where that bleeping noise is. <laughs> it's, 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 a, oh, uh, like, it's just, it's, it's getting a little bit more like, hey, hey, hey. I, I don't know if it's like, saying I need to you to do something or whatnot, but yeah. <laughs> I can remember, but I don't I don't have a timer set. I'm just hoping is uh, not one of my apps, just the I hope it's not one of the apps. Can you still hear me? Yeah I can hear you. I can hear you now than clear. You can hear me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. But yes. Let's see. Um, so. I'm just trying to see if I could figure out what the bleeping noise is about, but no, it it's all good. It's perfectly fine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so now. Okay, go ahead. I can hear you. Probably yeah. I have to ignore the noise. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think with uh, people like yourself uh, in the thick of things, I think with regards to, uh, well, the rural areas of Nigeria or Ghana, uh, well, basically in Africa in general, I think that will be, I think in the next five, ten years, I think this is going to be something which is going to be put in the sort of annals of history, uh, where like, there was poor, like poor sort of network coverage and everything like this, I think it might lead to um, quite a sort of new sort of uh, how can I put it, uh, e revolution, I would say, just like a new form of empowerment for uh, many uh, person in that uh, in the African that uh, in the African community, well continent, I should say. So it's just a case of. Uh, Companies have that belief and like basically pushing forward with it. And yeah, I think with regards to COVID, I think that's going to be one of the positive outcomes from this. Uh, yeah, uh, you know better than I. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Oh. I'm here. No, sorry, I, I'm here. Don't worry, I'm here. I, I muted because I didn't want the whole um, the, the ding dong sound. Yeah, you're right. So one of the, the 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 good things that will come out is that we would have emergence of um, new ways of doing things, and new sectors will come in the forefront, like mm. what you just said. Because now we start to see where the gaps are. You know, mm. see why we were not prepared, where the gaps are, and hopefully we will do things you know, do, do, do things to address that. So one of the things we will figure out or we will find out like we need to be digitally invested because we just don't want that for the upper class or the middle class or the cities. We want that for the entire population. Yeah. 
Because if we do have a situation like this, everyone is affected. It's not the matter of people in the cities or people that are educated. Everyone is affected. So if you want to create solution, you need to create solution for everyone, mm. irrespective of their location in the country. So and one of the good things that would happen is that sectors like you know, IT, tech, telecom, start to come in the forefront because they become important as a sector that could help you bridge the gap. And of course, people in those sectors will, will definitely have to step up and see how they can support the governments to bridge the gap. Perfect, perfect. Um, so, right, uh, it has been oh, over an hour and 10 minutes. Um, yeah, so, okay. If there was like, if there was a book or a film or like you could recommend uh, to someone uh, over these sort of lockdown times, what would it be? Uh, <laughs> I'm a girl who kind of go when it comes to movies, or so maybe books. Because <laughs> <laughs> movies, I, I don't watch something serious. I just want something that will make me laugh or smile and, you know, relax. But books, I love books. I love to read. Malcolm Gladwell is a writer that I so admire. Mm -hmm. books i find them quite intellectually engaging i love the fact that he brings new uh, he brings old concepts and new perspectives so i love most of his writing uh when it comes to reading non-friction or just uh, uh creatives uh i love um tony morrison uh, she's oh. an author i just found of recent and i, I love the way she she really goes there in her book, you know, she's an apologetic about her race, her gender, and she writes about characters that we have even taken for granted. And I love mm. the way she portrays them in a different light that we don't see, you know, sometimes we don't, we don't see a slave in that light. We don't understand they have feelings, emotions, and she portrays these characters in amazing light that you, you start to rethink. And it's good perspective because you bring it back to where you are, you know, how do mm. I treat Staff. How do I treat my domestic staff? Uh, how do I treat people that I think that are not essential workers? You know, that's a good way to look at it. But when it comes to movies, I'm like I'm a girly person. Any girly movie goes to me. <laughs> guess, guess what I just finished watching on Netflix, by the way. Jane uh, the Virgin. So that's the kind of girl I am. Which I don't know one? Jane the Virgin. Have you seen Jane the Virgin? I haven't seen Jane the Virgin. No. Now, this is the thing, uh, recently it's been, like, apart from mm, Tiger King, uh, I've been like, watching, like, that you past episode. Hmm? I, I, have, I haven't seen Tiger King. What was oh. the, I've watched them. Well, I do like documentaries, though. The Tale of the Two Popes, I love that. It was on Netflix as well. Yeah. Well, that well, was, well. I love documentaries, so I, I did enjoy that one. Uh, I was watching this documentary the other day, like, um, one of the things what sort of fascinates me when is like the craziness what went on in like sort of Florida in the sort of 70s and 80s with regards to like, yeah, um, how can I say with the cartels and like the whole drugs thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I just can't remember the name of it. Like they're like, it's like these, like these crazy sort of gangsters like now like we're operating in Florida now in like they've gone back to russia just as the fall of like the soviet union wow. so now like yeah these crazy cats like were like buying helicopters like military helicopters for 500 <laughs> like 500 dollars this is like this is this is how mad it is 500 dollars just flying down the street land in the middle of the street like I, uh yeah can you tell us where this and the lady's like is in that direction, get back into the helicopter, fly off. And like, yeah, that, like, that put it this way, I, it just builds into this mad thing where they, I think they're trying to get a submarine. Uh, yeah. uh, well, it, it reminds me of one I just saw on Netflix, The Ozarks, there's also a, a series on, on Netflix, The Ozarks. Yeah, like this has been with Ozarks, I've watched the first episode um, twice because I was like, okay, I watched it years ago. I was like, ah, oh, yeah. And then you know how it is. You get busy and like, you can't actually get back to it. So I was like, okay, got time now. Let me, like, let, me, let me get back to it. 
I watched it about oh two weeks ago, and yeah, I have not watched another episode of like the Ozark wow. because that. But uh, uh, all I've got to say is like, have you seen the Ozarks? Have you? I have. I've seen them times. <laughs> Yeah, look, yeah, look, so look, you know from the first episode, you watch what goes down in that first episode. I was just like, what? <laughs> it's like, yes. It's like, you're like, what? <laughs> so it's like, so yeah, anything what starts off that mad. Yeah, the craziness. Yeah, something else. I, I think, yeah, I've got to watch it. I've got to watch it, but I haven't, I've got time to watch it. But but I think if you ask me, you should see the Black Godfather. The Black Godfather. Yes. Okay. I shall. Yeah, I shall definitely look that up at, on Netflix, right? On Netflix. Okay. Black Godfather. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, okay. On that happy note, uh, yeah. Can you tell people where they can find you? Uh, yeah, like I put this right. Yeah, you are hugely in, like inspirational person. I think yes people definitely need to find you. So can you give me your social medias, everything? Feel free to connect. I'm everywhere. Literally, I'm on LinkedIn. It's Jane Egerton Edeha. You can find me on Twitter, Jane Egerton Edeha, or NK underscore A-M-A-D-I. I'm on Facebook, Jane Egerton Edeha. I'm on Instagram. And funny enough, you know, I just joined TikTok. I haven't figured out what I'm going to do. <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> You know what? I, I'm like I'm on TikTok, just like floating around. Not yeah. like I have no idea what I'm doing with that. So yeah, I only post occasionally. But yes, by all means, uh, yeah, what I'll do. I'm definitely. But I post do. I do also have a website, so that's an easy way. JaneEgerton.com. Perfect. The website, you get all the information. You find all my social media handles. So that's. The easiest way to reach me is janeegerton.com, my website. Excellent. I will put this information in the description as well. So, yeah, by all means, if anyone needs to find Jane, and I think you should, uh, you'll be able to get in contact with her. Uh, yeah, like, like, put it this way, like, yeah, this lady don't quit. She knows how to do it. So, yes. So please get in contact. Uh, yeah, subscribe to our different socials. And yeah, it's been a pleasure oh. having you on today, Jane. And Thank yeah. you so much. It was so much fun chatting with you. I can't believe we've chatted for over an hour. No, I would I no, it. No, I would talk some more. And yeah, I'm definitely going to, uh, how can I say, uh, be in contact. And yeah, I'll more than likely get you on this again. Um, okay. Yeah, I've got to say, if you can bring... Uh, a little bit of the effort and like determination and willpower you brought to many another like person uh, over there or in the world. I mean, yeah, this world would be a much better place. I've got to say thank you uh, very much for your time today. And yeah, I'd like to say thank you to all my friends, all my life warriors out there for uh, listening and listening to the podcast is much appreciated. Uh, until next time, I say peace, love, happiness, be all the positive bees you can be, and yeah, peace. <laughs>